sometimes, you know, you think of coughs and colds and, uh, you know, otitis media, those kinds of things, uh, you know, which is true. We actually see probably a lot of these things, right? Uh, you know, 4 a.m., uh, what better thing to do than to drag your kid into the emergency room uh, for their ear infection? So, um, you know, sometimes people just don't understand. They're, they're not uh, as well educated as all of us. And so, uh, they're a little ignorant to what could be going on. They think they're, uh, they're 99 fever, they're going to have a seizure, and they're going to die. So, uh, we will see them. So, we see lots of URIs, uh, lots of bronchitis, lots of, you know, those type of things. So, Sinus infections, all this kind of stuff. Uh, you just got to make sure they're not actually having an, an emergency with these things. So, um, some of these things will get, you might, you know, CHE complaint, sore throat, okay, sore throat, probably be strep, you know, or, or some you know, viral thing, that kind of stuff. You walk in, and the patient can't keep your spit, and, you know, uh, you know, and talk. So, like, all right, well, that may be actually something we're going to have to do something with. Uh, styes, I don't know how many styes I've seen in the yard, like, really? I don't even know what a sty is. <laughs> One year old person. Come on. All right. So, what we're going to talk about today is uh, epistaxis, okay? Uh, old bloody nose. Uh, angioedema, dental abscesses. I mean, it's kind of like not really totally like an emergency, but we see a lot of it, and a lot of people kind of get freaked out about it because I'm not a dentist, you know. <laughs> But there's some things we can do to help them. Okay. Uh, Ludwig's angina, uh, peritonsillar abscess, uh, foreign bodies, and mastoidus. Okay? So, uh, up steps. So, the bloody nose. Okay? Uh, so, it comes from usually uh, one or two places. So, it's either posterior or anterior. All right? Uh, posterior is the uh, really emergent one. Okay? There is, you know, this is the only few I've seen, it's just blood coming out of everywhere. It's going out the nose, coming out the mouth, it's, you're just like, how do you have any blood left in your body? It's, it's everywhere. And so, and you know it's been going on a lot of people on blood thinners, or uh, they have blood pressure, um, and so there's just blood everywhere, they've had maybe some kind of procedure uh, done back there. It's a line of last year, something like that. Uh, recently, so this is kind of one of those things you just kind of try and stop as much as possible. Uh, what we do in our ER is just pull the catheter, shove it up their nose, inflate it, and pull it back and clamp it off. And that seems to work okay. And then you run to your phone and call the ENTI because I'm not dealing with that. So, because yeah. you're not going to be able to get back in there and find the spot, you need scopes and they need to be sedated and uh, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, this is, but yeah, it is. Like, uh, I think I, when I did like, a trauma rotation in school, like, I saw less blood than I did when I saw like, one of these. It's <laughs> a massive amount of blood. So you always want to check, you know, make sure that you're not anemic or anything like that too. So, um, so most common is the anterior, okay, uh, this is that, that Kessel Beck uh, plexus or whatever, how do you say that, okay. Um, this is where it comes from, a lot of... Uh, Kids will get this when they're picking their nose, dry noses, that kind of stuff. Um, people that are oxygen will get this a lot. Uh, anybody who's blood thinners or high blood pressure get this quite a bit. Okay. Um, you know, worse in the winter when the air gets dry. Um, and, you know, people have a cold or anything that can, can cause that kind of stuff. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try the nasal pinching first. So. <coughs> I like to bring props, so um, you guys can pass these around. And who has my my uh, strap, my soft restraints? Yeah. Oh, you guys can keep everything up there, and we'll come collect it later. It'll be easier. So, so here's some laser clamps we use here. So that's, I probably wouldn't try them on. I don't know where they did. So, uh, <laughs> you can see it kind of kind of helps a little bit. Those are kind of nice because you know you tell somebody to pinch their nose. Uh, they probably aren't going to do it for long enough, right? But if you give them something that can go on there, they're more likely to leave it on there and kind of clamp it off. There. Ice packs as well, so I usually give them that and an ice pack, uh, and that can kind of really slow things down quite a bit. Okay. Then, when I first started, I was really, all right, oh good, we got it stopped. Don't move. Don't touch anything. Don't breathe through your nose. Don't do anything. 
Okay, now we're going to go out the ER, and you're going to go home, and an hour later we'll be back. Okay, <coughs> why? Because we didn't really solve the problem. We just kind of stopped for a second. Okay, so what you really got to do is get all that stuff out of there. So they have a bunch of clotting stuff in there, and it's gross, and you have to have them, you know, take that stuff off, you know, below, get all that junk out, and then you can try your, your you know, put the clamp on and those kind of things, okay? So uh, the thing that works best, uh, you know, as long as there's no contraindications to using it, is a uh, thin electric spray, okay? This is afferent, okay? Uh, though a lot of afferent now is like uh, something totally different, but, uh, but uh, neosinephrine is the kind of name brand for it, so uh, using this, it kind of shrinks up those blood vessels, plus it causes it to stop a little bit, okay? Um, and so, uh, if you can actually see the spot that's bleeding and you can't get it to stop, you can use uh, some cautery devices with silver nitrate sticks, okay? If you don't see it, just don't go touch it in there and you try to burn things. It's just going to cause problems. You can actually go through the nasal septum with those things. Um, not look at that. Um, if you can't get it to stop, uh, then it's called a rhino rocket, okay? Uh, so, basically something you insert. Uh, they kind of pack the nose, or nasal packing is another term for it. Okay? Uh, most people aren't actually packing it anymore. It's more of uh, uh, kind of a, a device that they've been pre-made. So, um, so here's this is kind of the, the catheter method a little bit. Um, it's kind of showing you wrapping it around and different stuff. It's just kind of the, the basics of it. So, oh. All right, so who's the president of your class? Yeah. Who's the vice president? Oh, right next to each other. Power. Power is condensed. Okay. Uh, so usually uh, I demonstrate the rhino rocket. And uh, usually we do it with the uh, president or the vice president. It's fair. Leadership is means showing that you are a leader and demonstrating that. So. But if somebody else would like to volunteer, and step up, you might oh, usurp so. their power. Come on, Anna. Um, you can do it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. There will be a prize. Oh, so why don't you just sit up here? Oh, so this is the device here, okay? Basically, it's a little kind of tampon-like thing with, a, with an inflatable thing inside, okay? I brought the very smallest size, okay? There are much bigger ones, okay? And I would probably use a little bit bigger size on, on hers, just looking at the size of her opening and that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> the same, the same. I'm not the <laughs> largest. Okay, just a little bit bigger. This is like more for a kid. So, okay? So, it'll be, it's not going to be pleasant, but. So, so, what we do is we get this wet, okay? That kind of activates some stuff on there that helps kind of clot and kind of seal things off a little bit, okay? And we're not going to blow it up either. That's so. Uh, so we use some water, and I usually use saline. Uh, you can use tap water, but uh, saline seems to work a little bit better here. So let me give you these. These are just in case you need to stop. Okay. Oh, and so this is what it kind of looks like here. So uh, just a just a little tiny thing, right? Okay. So your nose is really big, right? It's got this big cavernous area. Okay, so that's where you're trying to do. So, and then this this has a little syringe that flips on there, and it uh, will uh, kind of blow up that a little bit. So, okay, all right. So we're gonna put that in there. We got saline flushes here. Um, we'll just kind of soak it down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is why you never volunteer, never again volunteer. Yeah. So that's why I was in the Navy. That was kind of the, the same, right? So. All right. Let's so for a second. Crash the cameras for a second. Are you nervous? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, so we've tried our, our sprays, that kind of stuff, okay? We've tried everything, it didn't work. Yeah, we're just gonna have to do this, get this, this nose stop. So we have another little device here that can help us kind of open the nose up a little bit to kind of spread it open so you can uh, see in there, okay? So you said basically kind of tilt back and you put this in there, you kind of squeeze it open, gives you a little bit of So especially people, like, I got small enough days on things here, so that would be very helpful for me to see in there. So I have not used this in anybody's nose, so uh, I'm just getting a little closer to that. So we'll pass this around and we can uh, mm -hmm. see that. Okay. Yes. Okay. You got a side <laughs> one. Okay. <laughs> so I just had the patient kind of filter it back just a little bit. Okay. And then we, you don't go up. Okay. Because nothing's up, right? And this is also a point where when we're uh, talking to our moms about uh, sucking out their kids' noses. Everybody's going up to get the boogers, and there's no boogers there. And I can't get anything out because they're not going back. They go back. Okay, so. I'm just trying to get in there. So, all <laughs> so, so we're going to push back, all right, and until you get some resistance, and then you just shut. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and you're going to have to We'll breathe in, okay, but make it a little drip down the back of your throat. So don't worry, you can swallow this. You can just say that. Okay. Okay. Pull by your coat. Ready? Now it's starting to form toward your nose. Is it kind of going away a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So it's molding in there a little bit. That's okay. And then we blow it up, and it'd be even worse. But then it would kind of form around there. Okay. All right. So then we'd have the patient come back in a couple days, all right, um, or see an ENT doctor or something like that. So it's 48 hours now, and we get to have it out. Great. So what we're going to do is we deflate it, okay, make sure you deflate it. That's like trying to pull a catheter out without deflating it, okay? So, uh, all right, so now you're going to take a big blow out, one, two, three, yeah, all right, hopefully we need to go inside. Takes it out this way. Blow it Good? Yeah. Okay, hey, do you want your prize? Yes. Okay. <laughs> about how to do that. So not very comfortable. So that's why it's last resort, right? We don't want to do that. Uh, patients don't like it. Uh, and oftentimes they don't last very long uh, with that. Okay, so you, know, you try and get them for 48 hours and uh, they're probably not going to last that long. Okay. So let's move on. If they're pinching the nose, are they supposed to pinch down below the bones or above? So the it's right underneath the bone. That's where you're uh, areas there, so. Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure there's no more patients. Good job, thank you. So, uh, angioedema, we see quite a bit of this, really. And so, uh, you know, some people have this kind of hereditary, sometimes it's from medicines. Um, ACE inhibitors are probably the biggest one. Um, and so, uh, I kind of wonder, you know, how much longer I'm using uh, some of these things. So. Uh, it just seems like more and more people are getting um, injured from these things. So, uh, especially uh, African Americans, for some reason, seem to be more prone to this. Uh, whether there's more, and there is more hereditary you know, with African Americans. Uh, so maybe it's some kind of combination between the two there. Okay. So the the treatment for this is more supportive. You want to make sure that they have an airway. Okay. Now you can see these pictures here, or little images, or whatever. And these people's lips are huge. Their tongue can get huge. Their tongue can there, these are outside some, there's also swelling on the inside, edema on the inside. 
and so be really careful with that. So you're going to try steroids and Benadryl and Pepsid and epinephrine. It doesn't work. Okay, it's you're just kind of maybe kind of reducing some stuff just a little bit. Um, you've got to stop the offending agent. So uh, if you're admitting the patient for observation, don't keep giving them a the setup Not that they're going to be able to swallow it like that either. Um, you know, so uh, it's watchful waiting. So you definitely want to make sure that they are uh, um, monitored, probably a step down unit or something like that at the very least. Uh, so they be watch a little more. Um, they want to have things kind of ready for, uh, you know, maybe do some prep work for uh, a crike or a trach um, in case they need it. Uh, these people are going to do a very difficult intubation. So, so much swelling. Um, Usually, even a light scope or anything like that is going to be very difficult to try and uh, get down there and find, find the larynx. So, hereditary angioedema and the C1 esterase dysfunction. I just put that on there because it seems like it's always a test question. So, so the thing you got to know with these people are is, you know, even like they go into the dentist, a little minor trauma, they get their, somebody touches their gum too hard. And then they get this angiogenia. So you know, people have to be uh, really careful with those kinds of things. Same treatment, airway, airway, airway. All right, dental abscesses. Uh, I actually kind of like dental stuff. Um, you know, maybe I should have been a dentist. I don't know. But, uh, so this is, uh, you know, we see a ton of this, and people are like, you know, Kind of the first reaction I get a lot of times um, when people shadow or a patient, why would you come to the emergency room for a dentist? Why would you go to a dentist? Any ideas why they wouldn't be going to a dentist? They don't know how long they're not open. They're not open. They're not open. Okay, yeah, but it's two in the morning. Okay. They don't have insurance. They don't have a dentist. Money. Insurance, money, right? <laughs> so, yeah. And there are actually quite a few, uh, you know, low cost and free places in the city. Uh, you want to help your patients find somebody, if you Google uh, Delta Dental Free Oklahoma, so Delta Dental is a big dental insurance company, they have a whole PDF file that lists different places and events that uh, people can get low cost and free dental care. And so I have obviously put this off for my patients and you know, give them to them. We have a resource guy that's in there too. And so, yeah, that's amazing. If you don't follow up, I mean, they're going to be right back into your ER again. Because uh, it's not going to get better even if you try and fix the key problem. Right now. So, so uh, a lot of it is going to be subacute. Sometimes there's be acute, sometimes trauma. But uh, you know, a lot of times the uh, it's just a dental infection or a dental abscess. Okay, uh, we do see quite a bit of uh, not quite a bit. We see. It rare kind of facial trauma. Uh, we'll talk about this, I think, in the facial trauma section. I don't think it's in this one. Um, uh, uh, kind of actually putting people's teeth back in. Okay? Um, so, oral hygiene, you know, they don't brush your teeth, they don't floss, uh, low so socioeconomic status, diabetes, smoking, um, all these things are risk for substance abuse, all risk factors for, uh, you know, poor dentition. Uh, infection in the dental pulp is kind of where this is, so it's kind of in there, uh, underneath the layers there. You can also get like a gingival cellulitis, um, you know, around this as well, which is probably what you have a little bit of that redness right there. Um, oh, where's our pointer? So, that redness kind of there, might be a little of that. That's obviously the little exudate there from the abscess kind of poking out. It doesn't always look like that, and then you get to see that nice little hole there. Okay. Uh, and it's usually polymicrobial, right? Because the mouth is full of all kinds of bacteria. Mm -hmm. okay. So the treatment is going to be uh, some antibiotics. Okay. Uh, usually penicillins are great for this. You don't have to do anything too crazy. A lot of people have penicillin allergies. You kind of have to go through this a little bit, as a lot of times their penicillin allergy is my mom told me to have. Okay. So. Did you actually have a reaction when you were a kid, or, oh no, she has it, so I have it. Not true. So, uh, you know, it may be worth the risk, because penicillin's cheap. You can get that for four bucks, okay? Um, you know, 
uh, most free clinics are going to have that uh, readily available to get out. Um, you know, I can get that through the hospital pretty inexpensively and give that to them uh, you know, if I really need to. <coughs> Lindomycin, however, is going to be more expensive. Uh, and so uh, we're talking about 40 uh, 50 bucks. And so that's going to be a little bit harder to do. So you want to try and want to make sure that you can't use that those two medicines. So, um, so most don't require an IND. This one, that one on the previous one, I'd probably put a roll in that. I mean, that thing's ready to bust open. Mm -hmm. Let's get that drained. That'd probably help help them out quite a bit. So, um, you know, uh, ENT should probably be counseled if you're really going to do a whole lot. A lot of times, <coughs> ENT doctors don't want to have anything to do with dentist stuff. Uh, they feel it's not their scope of practice, um, so you kind of have to find a uh, oral maxillary surgeon usually, which is easier said than done. So, uh, pain meds, I try and stick to anti-inflammatories and topical things. Um, sometimes, uh, don't want to do it. sometimes people are really hurting, you can tell their you know, pulse is a little elevated and kind of stuff, their blood pressure is a little up, you know, sometimes those are good things. This is a pretty easy thing to kind of fake. You, know, you can have some nasty teeth uh, and come in like, ooh, that looks bad. Uh, and that may be a way it kind of chronically looks. They might have some chronically inflamed gingiva, their teeth are worn down, um, looks bad. Uh, you know, I'm not going to CT everybody or you know, do panoramic x-rays to see if they have a, a dental abscess or something down there actually. So. So it can be a common complaint of drug seekers. So <coughs> we try not to use narcotics. So, uh, so some things I use for pain. So good anti-inflammatory. Definitely be using some of like that. Um, you know, alternative Tylenol, um, Oragel. Uh, putting on like a cotton ball or Q-tip, putting back in the area. Uh, if they've got like a tooth that's kind of rotted out, you know, maybe some exposed nerve. Uh, clove oil works really well. Um, it can you know, taste like cloves for about a month. But, uh, it can really be pretty helpful. A dry socket, clove oil can help as well. Uh, and then you get a dental ball, right? So, uh, uh, so these are kind of fun. Uh, I actually like doing these quite a bit. You get somebody who's like really in pain, uh, you know, they're sobbing uncontrollably. Um, and you can numb it up, and that is, uh, you get some relief right then and there. So. And it is a uh, good uh, way of telling if somebody is drug seeking. You offer them a needle in their face and they don't take it because they suddenly have a needle phobia even though they're covered in tattoos. Um, probably uh, not going to be somebody I'm going to give a narcotics for sure. So, um, so yeah, so different blocks of infraorbital blocks. So your infraorbital nerve comes out right underneath your eyeball and it comes down and from the front gingiva and, and the lips as well. So um, we'll talk about lip lacerations, those kind of things. These are good blocks to use for these as well because you know, uh, put a lot of numbing medicine in the area where you're trying to sew. Okay. Uh, submental, so your submental nerve comes out right in the jawline here, so uh, <coughs> and, then, and then the infraorbital ulnar. Uh, so uh, these are in the back. This is the ones your dentist uses a lot to kind of numb things up. Uh, you want to be sure you know what you're doing with these. So just a little bit of some uh, training and those kind of things. So I've gotten pretty good at it. So here's infraorbital. So. Everybody's got a nice little retractor in their uh, in their arsenal there. So I just lift up the lid. So basically, you're aiming your needle towards their pupil. Um, you know, obviously, not going towards into their pupil, but kind of going up towards that way because that's the pupil kind of lines up right with that that notch there. Okay, and uh, you know, a lot of times you can even like kind of palpate that if you tap on it long enough, you can actually get a little tingling sometimes. So. You might want to warn them that their lower eyelid might kind of go a little numb. Uh, those are kind of normal things, so they don't really stroke or anything. Uh, uh, you know, these things hurt going in, so you kind of warn them about what's going to happen. So sting and burn for a little bit, try and breathe through it, it should go away soon. So, so mental, this is a really easy one. You just pull it back and put a bunch of numbing medicine under there. It's probably the easiest block uh, there is to do. So. And then uh, if you have a rule. Okay. So uh, this one, like I said, takes a little bit more uh, practice. Um, you're, you're using, you're going into an area where you uh, have some blood vessels you probably don't want to hit. So 
you definitely want to stay in the area. So basically, you kind of have two little lines back in there. Uh, it's hard to tell in this picture. But, uh, basically, a little line right here, and kind of a little line right here, and kind of come down together. And you're going to write in between there. You're going to aspirate. And so um, we don't have the fancy uh, syringes that the dentists do that has a little aspiration ring on there. So you kind of have to get a little tricky with it. So I've kind of learned to kind of be able to put my thumb on there and kind of aspirate a little bit with the needle. So you want to make sure your syringe is nice and loose before you try to do that. Okay. So when they first come out of the package, they're a little tight. So you can work them a little bit. All right. Um, that injects a numbness in there. It hurts. It stings. Okay. Uh, you can also uh, do a buckle block, so your buckle mucosa is all on the side of, the side of your cheek. You can basically have a little buckle nerve that kind of runs right through here. You can kind of start here, numb that up, and then as you just poke it again, put just a little well underneath there, make it a lecture relief. Really. Helps kind of numb everything up. And then you walk back in the room five minutes later, like, oh, thank you so much. Can I give you a hug? <laughs> So, uh, moving on. So, this is what I refer to as pretty much the, the true, like, dental emergency, okay? Uh, this is uh, potentially, like, threatening, okay? Uh, basically, a rapid expanding infection of the subindividual space. It is uh, all down through here. It, you know, almost looks more like, an out it could almost look more like a cellulitis or something like that on the outside uh, versus a, um, you know, something going on the inside. It's from a, uh, a dental uh, infection. And so, uh, mouth pain, drooling, <coughs> there's uh, trismus, so open and close your mouth real well, tongue protrusion, uh, and the key one here is sublingual edema. Okay? And so, uh, this is the first clue, early signs to this. Okay? Every time on the dental exams, uh, I'm look, having looked at their tongue and I'm documenting in the chart. That they did not have any sublingual edema. Okay? Uh, so even if it's just a regular dental infection, we make sure that when they leave my ER, that it looks like they did not have this. So it's very rare. Okay? I've seen one case, um, and uh, I had to transfer this patient to uh, another hospital that had a, an actual facial surgeon on call, and the ER doc who had been in the ER for 27 years told me. Uh, didn't believe me because he'd never seen it. So, yeah, so, so it sounds like it's pretty rare. Or he's missed a lot. So, uh, so those cases, like you said, come from lower molar abscesses, they can just get bad. Okay. Uh, treatments, the airway, IV antibiotics, okay, they could, they're probably going to need surgery yet in the abscess. Peritonsillar abscess, okay, so more infections. So often triage is a sore throat, um, you know, but they have a few other things kind of going on. You know, they'll describe their sore throat as being one-sided. Um, it's just on the right, the right side's really swollen. And they have this kind of uh, raspy kind of voice, sometimes referred to as a hot potato voice. I don't know what that means, but when you hear it, you're like, yeah, that's, that's, that's a hot potato voice. Um, and so they have trouble swallowing their spits, and oftentimes they're sitting there with the nemesis bag, uh, spitting into it or a cup. And, can swallow, it hurts. Um, and you look in there and you see uh, everything got pushed over a little bit, uh, big reddened area there. So, everybody tell, see where we're talking about here? So, this looks pretty normal. It's a little inflamed, but you know, this whole side is touching the uvula over here, mm -hmm. pushing everything over. So, uh, diagnosis uh, is going to be mainly kind of looking at it, but uh, to help kind of confirm things and kind of figure out what we're doing. Uh, probably get some blood work, make sure you have a really high white blood cell count, uh, especially with a tachycardic range of that. You get septic from something like this. Okay. Um, then, you know, get a BMP mainly because we're going to get a, a CT of the contrast and make sure you're not going to kill our kidneys. Okay. Um, we're going to get an ENT console, uh, a bid to watch. Make sure their airway doesn't get up. just if their CT read says anything about their airway, um, you know, that it's pushing on their airway or anything like that, or you know, some you know uh, mass effect or anything like that, that's probably not a good thing. Probably need to admit them, especially if they have you know risk factors like sleep apnea or anything like that. You definitely need to be this. Okay. So that's 
So uh, we can do an IND sometimes, uh, ENT will ask us, can you uh, uh, admit them, but can you guys uh, book a hole in it and see if we can get it drained in a little bit? Sure, we can do that. So um, medical management is the IV fluid and steroids. Steroids really, really help. You know, sometimes I will give a dose of uh, 10 milligrams of Decadron in the ER when they first get there. At the time their CT is very like, you know, I'm actually feeling a lot better now. Can I go home? I don't know. So, uh, salt water gargles really help. Okay. Um, helps kind of loosen things up a little bit. Sometimes you can drain just like that. Some of the AT docs will come drain in the ER. Sometimes they want us to do it. So, let's watch a video. <laughs> we have sound. Sometimes. Yeah. Shown here is a patient with a right peritonsillar abscess. Note the distension of the right anterior tonsillar pillar compared to the left side, and the slight deviation of the uvula. The throat is sprayed with 20% benzocaine for topical anesthesia. The right tonsil area is injected with plain 1% xylocaine without epinephrine. Epinephrine is not used because of the possible injection of the carotid artery. The abscess cavity is evacuated with a needle to prevent inhalation and aspiration of pus during incision and drainage with a knife. The mucosa is incised with the number 15. Yeah, we usually just use a needle, poke it open, and drain it. So, what I usually do is uh, take a uh, laryngoscope, like you use to intubate somebody. It's got a light on it, so it's very helpful. So, uh, sometimes I'll have a patient just kind of because they know where their gag reflex point is, you know, and so they kind of put that on their tongue to kind of hold it down. It shines a light in there. Moves everything out of the way. It's pretty nice. I can have them hold it. They can let me know if they're having any trouble. And so uh, that way, I don't, I don't have to have, use my hands or I have somebody else in the room to help me. Uh, so and sometimes we have like, a little light that you can put on your head. So we'll use that. And just come here, spray some spray, and then um, uh, numb it up. And sometimes we start numbing it up, it starts draining already. So uh, get in there, and it's kind of fun. A fun little procedure. She looks like a rock star. Make sure you the light on your head. So retropharyngeal abscess, you got to make sure you differentiate these. Sometimes they can look a little bit similar, and so sometimes they can actually have both, uh, which is very rare. Uh, so it's rare to have this, so uh, it's sore throat fever. The biggest one with this is they're going to have some neck stiffness and pain with it, uh, whereas the other stuff's going to be more kind of upper, not one of closer mouth, but, you know, the drooling. Uh, so they have this like, kind of mucal rigidity with it. This is a, it's kind of a retro pharyngeal space back here, so it's all back there. Uh, so almost might kind of think, if they have some headaches, it might actually be kind of make differential, like you're thinking meningitis or something. Okay. And kids, you get this retro pharyngeal bulge that's going to happen in the line. You can see that on the test. That's what you got. Okay. Um, it's caused by lymph drainage, uh, upper respiratory infections. Okay. Um, and it's polyproteal, I'm going to say. 
Uh, so uh, this is that's a retropharyngeal bulge. Okay. So you see everything kind of just pushing up there. You can even see the space for anything to go back down beyond that tongue there. So and this person here actually, in case you mind, actually had a peritonsillar abscess here and a retropharyngeal abscess here. So double A. That's no way. To Same workup as peritone scars, just going to be a CAT scan. Uh, these things, like I said, your differential includes meningitis. You might be talking uh, lumbar puncture or something like that as well. Um, so, treatments of airway or woodway with airway, and have prep work done for cry curtrate. Okay. Um, EMT consult, of course. Uh, you know, if you're at a smaller hospital, you want to think about you know, calling somebody to transfer this patient, of course. Give these people IV fluids. They probably have been drinking water or anything in days, uh, so they probably will be hydrated. IV antibiotics. I don't know. They're tachycardic and stuff. They might be to work up for uh, sepsis as well. Okay. Four bodies. Oh, my favorite. So, uh, kids put things in their ears and their nose. Uh, bugs crawl in the ears. In the, I've never seen it. I guess I've never seen a bug in the nose. But, uh, you know, people swallow things they shouldn't. Uh, Stuff flies in their eyes, so uh, you know, there's four bodies, everything. And it's all up here for some reason. So, um, so bugs are probably the most common thing to see. So uh, cockroaches love the ears, especially when it starts to get cold. They're nice little, little places to hide. So good reason to exterminate your house, right? So all right. Uh, so the ear form body things. Are, bugs are most common in adults. Uh, uh, <coughs> If you report, patient reporting that it's kind of alive in there, it feels like it's moving around still, uh, you just get some 1% lidocaine, have them lay on their side, put a couple drops in there, it'll kill it. Uh, works really well. So, uh, cockroaches, their legs have these little uh, things on there, and they kind of like stick to everything, especially the TM. They'll like, grab on the TM and not let go. So you can try and irrigate. Sometimes these bugs they don't want to come out very well with irrigation. Or there's added wax on there that makes it a little harder to do that. So sometimes you have to go digging. Uh, so uh, favorite tool for that is the old uh, alligator forceps here. So no, um, no, so no. Uh, so means you can kind of see when you kind of play with it. It kind of opens and closes. And, you can kind of go in there and reach in there and grab. Obviously, it's much longer than you actually need. Uh, so I always tell a patient, you know, you're going to feel some pressure. <laughs> That's always classic. You're going to feel a little pressure. Uh, but uh, this time, it actually feels pressure. And so I always tell them if they feel like they're going to move, to try and push their head into the bed instead of out. Or otherwise, we're going to right through the area. Okay. So and you, you have a high likelihood when you start to do this to actually like, scrape the, the EAC up a little bit. That's okay. You might get some abrasions. You can put them on some antibiotic drops or something. So, uh, so you, you go in there. Sometimes you can get suction and do it. So uh, there's like a little piece of suction kit. Um, little plastic pieces, especially like a uh, hearing aid or something gets in there. Or, uh, earbud piece or something like that, sometimes you can get in there and uh, just suck it out and it works pretty well. It's actually pretty cool to do that too. So can't get it, then you send them to EMT. Okay. Uh, it's not worth uh, sedating them in the ER for a little piece. Uh, EMT doctors have all kinds of cool little tools they can go there and get it much better than that. So. Nose form body, so uh, this is a, probably didn't really need an x-ray on this person, but uh, it'll be a good x-ray. So. I want to make sure it wasn't anything else in there. So you get something in the nose, uh, the smellier it is, the longer it's been in there. Kids love to push stuff in their nose. Uh, you know, usually when they come in, uh, first thing they ask uh, to the parents, or, did you try and get it out? Oh yeah, yeah, I tried to get it out. You know, how'd you try and do that? You know, I tried to reach up there, that kind of stuff. Uh, did you have a blow? No. So that's just the first thing I try. That's uh, about 30% of the time, that's successful. So, and comes right out, and, uh, 
you're like, you just wasted the whole effort. <laughs> so, uh, sometimes a little, little small child, you can have uh, the mom do this, I'm not doing this, uh, put the mouth, you know, mouth, mouth kind of blow, kind of, kind of blow in there and see if you can blow it out. Um, it's kind of scary. You can use a cat's extractor, which is this little guy. It's kind of old and I'm going to put some holes on. You guys can play this a little bit. Um, so it's basically a little syringe. It's got a little catheter on the end. And so uh, you basically stick it in past the foreign body. You blow it up and you pull it out. Whoever invented this is amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I need to give them something. So uh, I've had people come in. They've been to uh, you know, urgent care. They've been to the regular doctor. Nobody can get this thing out. I go in there and blow things in like two seconds. Of course, great for things like beads and beans and kids put their ears in their nose and stuff. Um, these are these are awesome. Alligator forceps cannot grasp round no. things. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. Very difficult. So if you don't have those specific things, there's little other little small catheters that uh, might have that, that at the hospital is used. So nose form bodies will be careful of magnets. Okay. Had a kid come in and uh, said, oh, he's got a magnet in his nose. Stuck it up there. He was like a 12 year old, so knew better. Uh, but and then they couldn't get it out. Well, it turns out they couldn't get it out because the kid had a magnet on the other side of the nose, too. So uh, they had uh, done this. And, you know, I tried a few things and uh, I tried to stick something too. You know, like I fit the forceps that as I'm stuck it up there. Uh, I tried another magnet, like we have the magnet for the, uh, turning out pacemakers. I tried that to try and reverse them or something. Uh, nothing was working. Call Ian, ear, ear, nose, and throat. And he's like, oh, thank God you didn't get these off. Uh, because we had this a few weeks ago and uh, took it off the OR and there was just blood in it. Uh, so because they are on there so long, uh, there's some degradations in the, to the septum and all the blood vessels are exposed. So take these off and this is blood. Probably not a good idea. I'm going to get deep deep thoughts on our magnets. Or just don't let your kids do that. That'd be fun. Or adults do. Yeah. <laughs> don't buy them. Yeah, magnets in general are bad. So. All right. Uh, I for a body. Uh, okay. Uh, the nurses think I'm really, really mean because uh, you know, I'm always harping on can we get visual acuity on the patient. Like, look, they're hurting really bad. They can't see. I don't care. I want to see it to good eye, and they can't see, they can't see it, it's fine, but I just need to know, we need to know what there is first, that way when we do something to them, we can say their vision was already, you know, 2080 in that eye when they got here, okay? If, you know, they didn't get that from me doing something to them, okay? Very important to have that in the chart. And even repeating it, visual cue that leaves sometimes. Uh, so, metal from grinding is probably the most common, especially in adults. Um, you know, they, uh, metal working, that kind of stuff. Or, uh, parts of uh, trees from woodworking, and, uh, sawing, on tree limbs is very common as well. Um, so, you can try and irrigate these things out first. Uh, you know, it's using some saline or some drops. Uh, you know, just a little tiny piece, sometimes you can wet it. Hot tip applicator, Q tip, and kind, of, uh, kind of rub it off a little bit. Sometimes that works okay. Um, just want to make sure you do a good uh, fluorescein stain and slip an exam. Uh, kind of take a really good look and see it's embedded in there pretty well. Uh, sometimes you can't get it. Uh, if you don't see a foreign body and they're still complaining that it seems like it, you can stain your eye. Maybe there's a corneal abrasion in there. If I want to flip the lid up, or at least kind of sweep their lid and make sure there's no foreign body on the lid itself. A piece of metal or a piece of wood or something like that on the sort of lid. Every time they close their lid, it's scraping, scraping, scraping. So, as you see, like this linear pattern at the time. <coughs> I burn. So, this, this sounds horrible, horrific. Uh, it's really not. Uh, you can numb the, the eye up pretty well. I used to be really afraid of doing this, but it's actually kind of fun. Uh, actually, you're looking through the slit lamp. And, 
stick this thing over. Um, it, it's not like a drill. It's basically a little scoop on it. And so we're basically just kind of scooping out uh, the metal piece and we scoop out you know, the rest ring around here to uh, get that done. Put it on some antibiotic drops and send it to ophthalmology. So. For my in the throat, um, you know, most common this is some middle aged male who has eaten their steak too quickly, uh, now chewed it all the way, he's really excited about it. It just goes down and gets stuck there. Uh, they feel like it's, uh, you know, they, like they can't breathe or something, that like they're breathing fine. Uh, they just really look uncomfortable. Okay, uh, You try a bunch of stuff, you can try, uh, you know, sometimes these people have looked up things online, they try drinking Coke, um, you know, to try and dissolve it a little bit. Sometimes it just helps. Uh, they try drinking meat tenderizer. Uh, makes sense, right? It's meat. Uh, you know, so they try these things, um, they try you know, drinking water, sometimes they're not able to drink the water, the water regurgitates. Um, so, uh, you can give some medicines, you can give some glucagon, some ativan, these kinds of things. Sometimes this helps. Uh, it takes, sometimes you'll do this, you'll call ENT, or uh, GI rather, and uh, they'll come in and uh, they'll play with the patient like, oh, it just passed right before I got here. Sorry to have waked you up to so, the glucagon uh, kind of acts as a smooth muscle relaxer to try and uh, get that, that piece of steak down there a little bit. Uh, you don't want this staying longer than 24 hours in there. Uh, it can cause some problems, more uh, risk of strictures, and that's going to think later on. So, uh, basically, uh, GI comes in, does an endoscopy. Uh, sometimes they push it down, sometimes they pull it out. Uh, usually put them on some uh, protonics or something and come follow up in the a week or so, get a rescope, make sure that all the other structures are being Questions? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, kids swallow things all the time, so, um, you know, you see these pictures of the coin, uh, and in the books, you're like, it's never going to look like that, and then you actually get one, and it actually looks like that. It's pretty crazy. So, um, and this kid here, uh, was a, uh, said, it was a nickel. It looks bigger than a nickel. Uh, it was about a three or three or four year old, I think. So, uh, yeah. So it's, you always get the side view so you can tell which orientation you're at. Okay. And so, uh, what would tell me that it is more possibly in the uh, airway versus the esophagus? Where it's at, maybe, okay. So it's, it's orientation, right? So if it's flat on the lateral, then it, it's going to be in this your esophagus is going to be a flat kind of pouch. So it's going to be in that orientation. So less likely to be in the airway there. Obviously, the patient will probably have more breathing trouble too. Yeah. So getting sharp, like <clears throat> these paper clips or Safety pins, that's probably not going to get, I got to have a line in there. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely want to get uh, ENT or GI involved here and see what they're going to do. A lot of times, things will, will let them pass on their own. Um, a lot of parents don't want to like that, uh, but it's a lot safer than trying to go after them. Um, you have pointy things, it's magnets, batteries, and it's time to do something. Usually, this is a transfer of children or something. So, uh, mastoiditis, okay, um, it's a complication of, of a regular otitis media, so it's something, especially if it's somebody that, you know, has already been seen for an otitis media, uh, or uh, maybe they're seen and somebody thought it was otitis externa, and they put them on some antibiotic drops, or they've been on, or on amoxicillin, uh, or they put them on a Z-Pak, you know, because a Z-Pak cures everything at the urgent care. And so now this is kind of a, a re so this is kind of a, a sequelae to, to that. So, um, so these are some kind of history of that. Um, but it's caused by fluid blocked from mastoid hair cells. Uh, you got a lot of pain uh, with this. Swelling, you actually see swelling in the even kind of the post-auricular area. So 
we need to kind of make a differential between this and an abscess back here, or is it just lymph nodes that are in plane back here? We need to make sure that's not what's going on. Okay. So, uh, so when we look in the ear, uh, the canal is not involved. Okay. Uh, most of the, unless there's both going on. Right? The connect, so there shouldn't be a whole lot of hepatitis externa stuff. There shouldn't be a whole lot of swelling to the ear canal. You might have uh, some, uh, some fluid or some air in the, behind the eardrum, uh, some erythema back there, <coughs> some ear to it. Okay. Yeah, so that's what we have to differentiate there. So if we have, if we're thinking it's a lymph node, <coughs> most likely, especially a, a post auricular, we're probably thinking there's some kind of external ear or ear canal involvement. So if we can see any of those things, then those lymph nodes probably shouldn't be too involved. Okay? Because your otitis is probably going to have more cervical lymph node. Okay? No. So we get a head CT. Okay? There's, sometimes there's specific uh, mastoid uh, CT images you can order. So we want to get it with contrast, it's a little better view of those. Um, but the regular head CT, you can find this as well. Uh, they need antibiotics, sometimes they need some kind of uh, you know, hole poked in somewhere to get a drain. Okay, obviously you're not doing that. Or Cephan or Levaquin would be the, the treatment option for these. So, so here's the, kind of a picture of it after here. Uh, you got your friendly arrow sign on your uh, CT that tells you exactly what you're looking at. Here, so. Mm -hmm. so, all right, so we have a case. 20 year old guy, sore throat for four days, uh, seen at the urgent care, placed on that Z pack. Ah, Z packs. Okay. Uh, patient states it's hard to swallow, uh, pain on the left, and he's going to have trouble handling his secretions. Okay? What do we think is going on? Get image here. Oh, I think this is a video. <coughs> or just save this image. Oh. Anyway, they had a very nice abscess. You were right. You won. And so, what are we going to do? IND. IND. Okay, we'll try that. Yeah. What are we going to do first? We're going to do a little workout first? Yeah. So, is this steroid? Oh, I said airway. Airway, yeah, oh yeah. Okay, steroids would have been a good answer though. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, airway, uh, you know, we're going to think about that. We're going to make sure we're going to get the lab work, we're going to get a CT maybe. Um, you know, we don't always have to get the CT, but uh, I think it's a good idea. As you can tell the sign, get an actual number, and say, hey, this is. Um, so, a lot of times when you read a CT, there is going to be one or two things. You're going to say, you know, uh, ring enhancing, uh, you know, fluid collection, uh, you know, give a uh, amount, you know, 3.5 centimeters, you know, 3.5 centimeters, that's, that's like three fingers, you know, right there. That's pretty big. So, um, you yeah, that size, or it's going to say something called a phlegmon, okay? That's like what the radiologist says, like right before there's an abscess. So maybe it's just it's more it's kind of edema, and maybe there's a little bit of some stuff, but no obvious fluid collection. You're not going to want to go poking a hole in, in a phlegma. You're not going to get out of the lung and just torture the patient. Yeah. All right, so. so the radiology read for the CT you couldn't see was uh, a left tonsillitis with palatine. This is my patient had a retropharyngeal abscess as well. So, um, so the diagnosis is pretty easy because it's, it's given to you on the CT exam. So. As they often refer to the CT machine as the diagnosis machine. So mm -hmm. you put somebody in a CT machine, they come up with the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, let me talk about the treatment. Questions? How's your nose?